If anybody's in favor, I'd like this friend of mine to have a chair. Do you mind having a chair? I have a presidential that it doesn't say. Am I right at your feet? Thank you. Thank you. Let's start with a little meditation, please. That was such a beautiful message that we just can't go away from that quickly. Let's hold on to this thunder. As you know, you've got to know the letter of truth, but there comes a moment when you've got to step into this spiritual experience because that's where the work is done. After we learn how to tie shoelaces, we tie them, and we don't spend our time tying them all day. The letter of truth is necessary, but so is tying shoelaces. Now. In this particular tape, Joel has given us that level of consciousness which was the level on which the Master did the great works. And I believe that the word faith is a very important bridge to that level of consciousness. Now you will notice in this Temple Gate beautiful experience that Peter said, Why marvel ye, men of Israel, that we have healed this man? We didn't do it at all. The Father within. But if you just go back a few years, that very same Peter wasn't able to make a statement like that himself. He was completely unable to make a statement like that at the time, in fact, directly after the Mount of Transfiguration experience, he couldn't make such a statement. But within two, two and a half years, three years, something had happened to him so that he was now in the fourth dimensional consciousness. Let's go back to that Transfiguration experience and see the difference there a different Peter. And let's presume for a moment that each of us could be that Peter at one stage and then at the stage of an experience whereby those who come to us find the light within our consciousness. On the Mount of Transfiguration, we see a Jesus who suddenly becomes light and we see a Moses and an Elias appear. And then the disciples find, when they finally open their eyes again, that only Jesus stands there and Moses and Elias are gone. They're told, tell no man of this until the Son of God is risen from the dead. And you can be sure that made no impression on them whatsoever. Until the Son of Man has risen from the dead, whatever did that mean? And then they asked him some questions about Elias, and he mentioned that Elias would come again. In fact, had. But the world couldn't accept Elias any more than they could accept the Son of Man. And they finally realized he was talking about John the Baptist, who apparently was the reincarnation of Elias. Now, this was a transcendental experience in the fourth dimensional consciousness to which he had lifted Peter, John, and James. 
in it, they had seen they had seen a new level of man. They had seen Jesus transformed. They had seen that there was a body of spiritual light. They had seen that those who were considered dead were not dead. That there was life in the invisible. They had seen that Moses was there, that Elias was there. They probably never recognized two or three years later that at the crucifixion Moses was undoubtedly there, Elias was undoubtedly there, and possibly hundreds of thousands in the invisible standing right there. But this was being revealed to them at this moment. And the instant they came down from the Mount of Transfiguration, all this was forgotten. All this was forgotten. Practically the next moment there's a man coming to Jesus and he says, your disciples could not heal my son. He's a lunatic, moonstruck, epileptic. He froths at the mouth, he runs into the fire, he doesn't know what he's doing. And they couldn't heal him, will you? Now you know he loved his disciples. In fact, he was here to train them. These were his chosen ones. And yet, what did he say? O oh, faithless, perverse generation. Faithless, perverse. In referring to the very same men, one of whom later was able to say at the temple, beautiful, why marvel ye men of Israel? Think of the transformation that must have occurred in him when in one moment his own teacher, Christ Jesus, is saying, O faithless, perverse generation, referring to Peter, James, and John, and the other disciples, when three of these had already been with him and had seen the transformation of man, from man of earth, the physical self, to man of light. But they couldn't heal the epileptic. And he called them faithless. And you know that Peter was not faithless in the sense that we would call a person faithless today. Peter had faith. James had faith. John had faith. But not your understanding of faith, nor mine. Their faith was not the faith that he called faithless. And so we must examine that word, mustn't we? And we must examine the word perverse, because its meaning there was quite different than our current terminology of perversion. Perverse. Let's look at it in the Latin. To turn. To turn through. To turn around to turn in many directions. The meaning there was to turn in many directions, scattering our forces instead of concentrating in one direction. You might call perverse in that sense the opposite of concentrating. They had not found a center, and therefore they scattered and ran in all directions without any real sense of direction. And that's the meaning of perverse. And the reason they did that is because they were faithless. Faithless about what? Let's go a step further because he gives us the answer. If you had as much faith as a grain of mustard seed, you would say to the mountain, remove, and it would remove. Now then, the faith of a mustard seed is what they didn't have. Now let's see what they did have. They saw an epileptic, and they tried to heal him, and they couldn't. But if they had the faith of a mustard seed, they wouldn't have seen an epileptic. The mustard seed becomes a tree. They were looking literally at what they were seeing, 
instead of seeing that as a mustard seed becomes a tree, this epileptic is not what he appears to be any more than the seed is what it appears to be. It appears to be a seed, but it's really a tree. This epileptic appeared to be an epileptic, but it was really the Spirit of God. Now the faith of a mustard seed then would be that in which you would accuse the mustard seed of being only a seed and it would reply to you, oh no, I'm not. You can only see me as I appear to be. My reality is a complete and total tree, one of the greatest. Don't mistake my little appearance now. I am a great and flowering tree. And of course this is very illogical. But true. And now as we look at an epileptic, it's illogical to think that it's something else, but it's something else. And therefore, a Jesus, not seeing an epileptic, not seeing a seed, but seeing the tree, could see the divine image and likeness where the world would see the epileptic. And that brings us to our understanding of faith. We look out today... We do not see beyond the mind perception, the vision perception, the touch perception, and yet inherent in everything we are looking at is the fullness, the divine image, the complete divine image and likeness. Now faith then would be the ability to look with eyes that see a seed and yet through, in a vision, to see a tree. Faith would be then your invisible evidence which you accept, your evidence of things unseen which you accept as reality now. Not tomorrow, but the tree today is the, is the, is the, is the seed today. They are both one and the same. One is the vision of the eye, and one is the vision of the soul, and they are both here now. That is the word faith, as he's trying to show us, was lacking in his disciples at that time. Now we, also disciples, must develop that faith. We must be able to look at the man and see the transfiguration. You must be able to look at the flesh and see the light. Now you'll see the flesh with the eyes. But with your soul you must fill the gap of what you cannot see, knowing that what is there is the fullness of God being, and your faith fills the gap between what the eye sees and what the soul knows is there now, and that is faith. That faith enabled Peter later to make his demonstration. So that at this moment, whatever your problem, your faith tells you, my eyes see the problem, but my faith tells me God is there. Now then, with that newfound faith, you come beyond merely the belief that God is there. You come into the active demonstration of the presence of God because your faith becomes a springboard for your conviction. You stand on that faith, you act out from that faith, it becomes your new center, your focus of operation so that you're not perverse running in all directions, but rather you're concentrating from the center of faith. And then you look at the epileptic and you say, how now? If God is the creator, if all things were made by him, then all things are perfect. And this epileptic, who himself is squirming in all directions, is the false appearance of the reality that God put there. Only faith tells you that. And in that moment, you are released from the appearance because faith lifts you into the trueness of the correct vision of God's presence and because of your faith 
the problem is dissolved and there appears that which you had faith to know even though it was invisible to your sense of vision. Your faith has made thee whole, he said to the hemophiliac. All she did was, did was touch the hem of his garment. But he emphasized she knew that the Spirit of God was present and this was the nature of her faith and because of this faith the knowledge of the invisible presence of the Christ she was made whole now we have to develop that kind of faith which can look at any untoward circumstance even a mountain a mountainous problem a mountainous situation and quietly with faith say remove the sheer knowing that the presence of God is the only presence removes the mountain nothing is impossible to God and therefore one who has developed the faith in the presence of God fulfills the scriptural statement that nothing is impossible to one who has faith. Faith in the fullness of God's presence in spite of the appearance. Now this brings us to a different meaning of faith than we may have had. I'm sure all of us felt that we have faith. I certainly felt that I had faith but there comes a time when you discover what you thought was faith was merely an intellectual belief and the flood rises and you run fast and your faith suddenly disappears because it never was there any more than Peter's was there or the disciples who couldn't heal the epileptic we have termed faith when what we really mean is a sort of a, a mental belief Oh yes, I believe in God. But faith is deeper than believing in God. Faith is the unshakable conviction of the presence of God here and now, at all times. And with that unshakable conviction, you begin to find that every temporal appearance is knocking at your door in vain. Now, hypnosis is the nature of this world. <clears throat> We're in the third grade, and our teacher gives us a few problems in mathematics, and we learn these things, and if we don't solve them, she repeats the problems and teaches us how to solve them, and then finally we go into the fourth grade, and now the problems are intensified. We have that little backlog behind us. We can do a higher problem finally the fifth, sixth, and finally when we're up into the eighth grade we're doing problems and we can solve them because we've been through the third, the fourth, the fifth, straight on up. And so it is with this human experience. The degrees of hypnosis are intensified. At first they're very simple. You look out and you see things which you believe are so. You see the railroad tracks, you see them come together and you learn they don't and this is the solution of a problem you have overcome the illusion of railroad tracks coming together you still see them with a visible eye but something in you your experience tells you they only appear to come together so you're out of that hypnotism you're out of the hypnotism perhaps that there's a horizon you learn it only appears that way and as you approach it it moves back and it moves back and it moves back it isn't even there you won't fall off and Columbus reached that conclusion and here we are now these problems are all hypnotic but they are all optical at this point and now as you rise in perception you're given a cold let us say and now your problem isn't an optical illusion anymore, it's a different kind. You don't uh, breathe as freely. The things you smell don't smell quite as they did before. 
you don't talk very distinctly. There are other senses involved in this hypnosis. And then in a week or two, you shake it all off and you say, I lost my coal. What you really mean is you have overcome hypnosis. It just took you that long. And now the problems are intensified because all of this human experience is a parade, a succession with continuity, without interruption of hypnotic problems. You're in a school. The hypnotic problems come at you one at a time, ten at a time, a hundred at a time, but they never stop. And their purpose is very clear. Now the right side of your body is paralyzed. All of it. You can't move your facial muscles, your arm won't even budge an inch. But in time, after you try many things, something happens and then your mind unlocks those muscles and you begin to shake it off. Maybe a pill, maybe a hypo, maybe some kind of a psychiatric treatment or psychological treatment or a metaphysical treatment. But it goes finally and you say, well, I'm cured of bursitis. All that's really happened is you've been hypnotized and something has broken that hypnosis. That's all that's happened. But let us say you finally get up to the point now where you're facing the deadly diseases. Now all five senses are involved in hypnosis, not just the eye. You're up in the eighth grade or ninth. You're getting your PhD perhaps, but you're out there and all five senses now are hypnotized. Everything about you is in, under the complete hypnosis of, let us say, cancer. It's still a teaching. It really is still a teaching to teach you something very important. Of course, we don't all learn that lesson. Not right away. But you see, there comes a moment in this teaching of the hypnosis of life itself, this human life, where you finally reach the point where the doctor doesn't help, and where the pills don't help, and where the psychiatrist can't do you a bit of good. In fact, nothing will help. And finally, in your desperation, you call out to God, and that doesn't help. You have appealed to your concept of God, and that doesn't help. Your back is against the wall. You're hopeless, you're helpless, there's nothing you can think of. And the purpose of this hypnosis is going to drive you that way again and again and again through many reincarnations until one day, in your helplessness, in your hopelessness, something in you is going to happen a response, the beginning, the first squirming of an understanding, oh, wait a minute, there's something in me, not out there, not this God I call to, there's something in me that can conquer this. There's something in me that's indomitable. And this is the beginning of the awareness of your spiritual selfhood. The hypnosis has finally driven you to the point of recognizing the Christ of your own being. And that's the only reason it's there. That's the reason for the hypnosis called this world, to drive you to the realization that until you discover the Christ of your own being, this hypnosis will forever be here. We'll never escape this world until we find the Christ of our own being. It won't be from pills or doctors or psychiatrists or psychologists or appealing to God. It must come from the inner realization that where I stand God is. And then you see, there's no need for hypnosis anymore. That's when all the hypnosis of this world begins to dissolve when within you begins this birth of that Christ. Now as it rises within you, you find it handles every situation and it's never hypnotized. 
And so hypnosis disappears for you. You're out of this world. You're into the fourth dimension because that is the Christ. Now, until that happens, faith plays the part of filling the gaps. Until the Christ of your being can take over and say, Lo, I am here. Come unto me, ye who are heavy laden, I will give thee rest. Until that, you must transcend the logic of your senses. You see, the senses are so logical. They say, look, here it is. You've got it. But have you? Your senses are hypnotized. Your faith tells you the senses are liars. Because God made this creation. There's nothing but God's creation. And therefore the sense is bearing false witness. It says there it is. But your faith says the sense is a false witness. And so you find that your faith is the pathway, the password, the passageway, the pathway to the ultimate Christ realization. And you've got to live out of that faith until it happens. If you don't, we too are the faithless, perverse generation. Now there's the anchor we have to build around until we can walk out on the waters and say, I don't see it there. It only appears to be a seed at the moment. But the fullness of that complete tree must be there in the invisible. It's not logical to see a tree where there's only a seed. It's not logical to see a man walk out of a tomb. It's not a bit logical to see multitudes fed by a few loaves and fishes. There's not a single restaurant in the world would care to try that today. It isn't logical. And yet the very essence of faith is that it fills the gap between the logic of the mind, which falls short of the actual truth. And the faith takes you past the logic which falls short into the illogical truth and brings you face to face with reality. There's no logic in faith whatsoever, except the supreme logic of showing you the invisible, which the mind cannot see. Now then, we go back to our Mount of Transfiguration. It's very illogical to expect to see Moses and Elias, but there they are. They always were there. We're being told that man is immortal. Jesus is showing us that his reality is not a physical form, that he too was like an invisible mustard tree, although he appears as a seed. He's showing us this higher level, which is there, unperceived by the logical mind, but nonetheless there. And so if we stop with logic, we never can understand the Mount of Transfiguration. And of course, Peter and John and James at that moment were logical men. And so these logical men saw an epileptic, because that's what the mind said was there. Had they been able to go beyond logic into faith, they would have seen the invisible body of that epileptic, just as the invisible body of Jesus was revealed to them on the mount and translated down to us, we must each recognize that where the physical body appears, there is a potential mount of transfiguration. We are all the invisible, infinite Christ. We must recognize ourselves and live from that focus which has faith in our reality instead of our visible appearance. How would that change your life? It would acknowledge Him. It would take us out of our own personal doctrines 
it would release us from the belief that we have the power humanly to do anything, we would in turn not be perverse, we would not be unscented, we would not be without faith, but we would find that we could say, unto the Christ of my being nothing is impossible, and so I stand rooted in the conviction that Christ being omnipresent, perfection is omnipresent, and I have learned to some degree that quality which made the transition for Peter possible to the man who could say, Why marvel ye men of Israel? We each are going to have our temple beautiful experience. We each are going to see the miraculous as our faith brings us to this fourth dimensional consciousness. Now without faith, you can see how we would stumble in the dark. We know the logical mind cannot see what is, so only faith can take us the distance between where we seem to be and what really is. Now that is the difference between blind faith and a faith born of experience. And if you don't have it at this moment, remember Peter didn't either. It comes through a concentration on the principles, through the experiences of meditation, through the presence announcing itself to you from time to time, through the great works that the presence does through you, and ultimately, I have chosen you. You feel this faith. It's suddenly there. Out of nowhere is this great plateau of certainty. And you don't run when the flood comes. You hold your hand up. Peace be still, it is I. Because now you have the faith, which yesterday was but an intellectual belief. And when this faith is born in you, you may be sure that the Christ is rising within you, that the realization of the Christhood of your identity is very close, because that faith is the sign that you have been chosen. It isn't something that you develop out of your will. You're nudged, you're tapped on the shoulder, and this faith appears. It is a substance. It is not an idea of the human mind. It is a divine substance, just as love is a divine substance. And incidentally, this faith eventually leads to the fullness of the love of God being implanted in you and freed in you for you to let flow through you to the rest of the world. Now let's play with faith and realize that whenever we are accepting a negative, an imperfection, a discord, a lack, whatever its nature, our acceptance of that should be a sign to us that we are faithless. It's no crime, but it's important to recognize faithlessness in yourself. Because the turning from faithlessness to faith is the beginning of the spiritual experience. Try to recognize this when an imperfection comes to your attention. And the reminder to yourself that if I had the faith I could stand here will begin to develop in you the faculty which can stand and see, not a seed, but a mustard tree, right where the rest of the world is seeing a seed. I thought I might go out and buy a lot of these seeds and just plant them all over my house just so I could see them all the time as a reminder. I may even do that. It's important to know that the fullness of God is present 
every single second of your eternal life. Now let's be quiet for a moment. You know, we are all pursuing the identical path. There's probably not a single person among us who at any time would reject the opportunity to be healed of anything, whether it be a bad business or bad health or bad income. And sometimes the uh, stress seems to be placed upon that phase of this work to such an extent that we get lost in the jungle of speaking about healings. And of course, that is not the ultimate purpose of this work by any means. If it were, I can assure you there wouldn't be an infinite way at all. There are places to be healed. There are places to be repaired, to have those bones put together again. Healing in this work does occur, but it is only a brick in the building that you're building. There's a different kind of an edifice which doesn't stop with a healing. And it's necessary to go through the phase of healing emotionally, financially, mentally, physically. It's necessary to go through this phase, but only that you may emerge in a higher realm. And oftentimes you can't emerge into that higher realm unless you go th through the preliminary stages, which often we call healing. The reason healing becomes a necessary stage is that when you have acquired an ability to look out upon this world and to see that there is no power in it, you have released yourself into a realm where you can begin to function as you really are. Healing, you see then, begins to liberate this imprisoned splendor which Browning talked about and which Joel reiterates so frequently. Suppose you were to look out at this world and to see error all around you and to then become so mixed up with it and so muddled that all of your time was spent trying to raise your income, fight off bad health, seek ways and means of overcoming this and overcoming that. How could you ever be spending any time at all glorifying the Father? And furthermore, are we not, in our own ignorant fashion, are we not accusing the Father of creating an imperfect universe? Are we not saying, Father, look, there's a war going on. Look, there's hospitals crowded with people, some dying. Are we not saying to the Father every time we even buy an insurance policy that we figure we're going to be killed? Do you see how subtly, without wishing to, we slander the Father? The same Father we turn around and say, Father, help me. Help me correct this imperfect universe that you built. Now this week long, we've been working with Joel's letter in which he talks about this world, which is our material sense of the invisible kingdom of God. This isn't news to you by now. You've read it in his works for many years. You've heard it on his tapes. But a strange thing happens. Every time you hear it again, you discover that you never really learned the lesson before. You read it. You said, oh, that's true. How wonderful. And you even dismiss the errors of other people. Mortal mind just threw it in the ash can. But strangely, the errors persisted. We have only come to one side of the coin, even in the healing. And I'd like to discuss the other side of it with you. Now in the healing, you notice that you look out upon this world and you see tribulations all over the place. Sometimes they hit home. 
They come right through your door, uninvited, and there's a boy who's sick, or a wife who's ailing, or there's a bill that can't be paid. And now, all of a sudden, everything you've read about the material sense of the universe which we entertain is just another book on the shelf. That fear begins to bob up and down like a yo-yo inside. All we can think of is, how am I going to get it paid? How can I get Johnny back on his feet? And Lord, if the wife isn't better tomorrow, how can I even go to work and leave her here? There's no one to take care of her. We forget in, in an instant. I've even seen some people who consider themselves excellent metaphysicians. Very indignant when you say to them, what about this old age here and this tidal wave there and these broken bones of the boy over there? And that person will say, oh, it's more to mind, throw it away. Don't bother with it, it's more to mind. And that very same person in his own family, oh, brother, it isn't more to mind anymore. We've got to get out buckets. We've got to go to work. We've got to do something. This is real. You see, it's so easy to accept intellectually something that never becomes a foundation of truth in our own consciousness at all. And there's a reason for it. We hope to fill that gap a little today. Now let's take that old woman again. Let's take the tidal wave as we've been doing all week with students at home. And let's take the broken bones. And as you look at them, you've got to face one important question first. And that question is, how did they get there? You who believe that God is all, you must answer, how did they get there if God is all? If God is all, what about these broken bones? What about that destructive tidal wave? What about that woman who says, I'm 80 and I'm going to die? How can God be all and this be true? Reconcile it. You can say mortal mind. You can say it all day long. You can say it while the tidal wave is coming and overpowering the entire city. You can say it while this kid spends six months in a cast. Your words won't do a bit of good. Why, in God's perfect universe, when God is all, do these things appear? What is the logical, simple explanation? So that we can once and for all say, oh, I see it, I understand it, and therefore, I can be free of it. Let's look at the pantheist who says God is man. God forms himself, his very substance, into man. You know that's Hinduism, don't you? And now, this man is sick, so we have a sick God. Or this boy has broken bones, and so the bones of God are broken. We have a God who is anything but perfect. And so we have to throw that theory out the window. We come to the theist, just the opposite. And that encompasses three of the major religions of the world. Christianity, Judaism, Islam. All believe that God made man of a substance other than himself. And so there's God here and there's man there. And the twain will meet someday if man behaves himself. You've got the theistic point of view there, that God the supreme being and man and the other creatures are either going to find the reward in hell or heaven, depending upon just how far they can go in listening to those commandments and obeying them. The Buddhist goes in between somewhere, but not far enough perhaps, and just banishing all of it. It's all illusion, maya, let's forget it. Let's not bother about this lifetime. You can see it when you're driving a car and they shuffle past you on the street sometimes, completely unaware of the car. It's all maya, all darkness. It's illusion. And maybe when we get out of this illusion and die, life will begin. Now that's that theory. But Joel comes along 
and gives us a middle path. A middle path which actually three quarters of the population of this universe are completely unaware of. A path that doesn't say God is a man, a path that doesn't say that this is all illusion and it's a void otherwise, a path that doesn't say God created man out of a different substance than himself, but rather we come in with this middle path of seeing that God is the only being. There is nothing but God. And that which we behold, which is imperfect, is our distorted misperception of reality. And there's still a missing link, and that's the other side of the coin. Now then, you're looking at this old woman, you're looking at this tidal wave, you're looking at these broken bones of the child, and because God is all, you must realize that right where this old woman appears to be, God must be, but God isn't the old woman. You're seeing God through that glass darkly. You're seeing the tidal wave through a glass darkly, the broken bones through a glass darkly. But how, why? What can you do about it? The father gives us a clue. He says, son, your thoughts are not my thoughts. So he does have thoughts. Where are they? They're all through the infinite. God's thought waves are flowing all about us. You're right in Genesis, in God's thought. Do you see that his spirit animated by his thought becomes the thought waves of God, the perfect creation, infinite, invisible, indestructible. These are the thoughts he's speaking of when he says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. The infinite creation, the spirit of God, animated by his thought, moves in wavelengths in the invisible, infinite waves waves of thought, waves of divine thought that nothing can ever destroy, in which all of creation is. There has to be a translator for those waves of thought, just like radio waves or TV waves. And now look at the universal sense, what it does. Just imagine if you were, for example, to pour the Pacific Ocean into the eye of a needle. On one side you'd have the whole ocean and here's the needle. What would come out through the eye of the needle? A little thin thread-like stream while the ocean is going in. The ocean goes in, a little thread-like stream comes out. And you really describe what happens when the mind of man tries to catch the infinite thought waves of God. They're bigger than the Pacific Ocean. And our mind in proportion is about the eye of that thimble, that needle. What comes out? The reality, the fullness? Of course not. We have a little fragment. And now the collective mind of man does just that, receiving the fullness of God through a needle's eye. It throws out these visible distortions. And there you're looking at one, that old woman. And there you're looking at one, the tidal wave. And there you're looking at another the broken bones. They're not created by God. They are our collective mental distortion of his perfect thought wave, his perfect universe. Your thoughts are not my thoughts. My thoughts are infinite and perfect. Your thoughts are finite, fragmentary, and consequently distorted. Now there's no woman there who's old and dying. There's no boy there with broken bones, and there is no tidal wave there for the simple reason that God didn't create such things, and there's no other creator. And then you say, why do I see them? First, the universal sense puts them there, and number two, and this is why our dear friend who just says mortal mind finds that nothing happens. Number two is that there's a you 
there to receive these false images. Yes, it's that you that is there receiving these false images which seals the hypnotism and seals the distortion and seals the appearance of this world which is not your father's kingdom. Remove that you and watch what happens. Then this universal sense can throw at you every form of discord in this world. But if you're not there, if you're not there with a receiving mind, how can you be hypnotized by it? If you happen to be Jesus Christ standing there with a mind that was in Christ Jesus, instead of this human mind, you can't be hypnotized. You don't see a tidal wave that needs to be treated. Peace be still it is I. Broken bones, epileptics, old age, dying, that's only in the human mind. It isn't in the Christ mind, is it? And so where you're standing, fending off these human discords every day of your life, of one nature or another, it's about time to say, wait a minute, I'm getting tired of fighting all these illusions by myself. I'm just a mirror for the world discord. It hits me and bounces back and I look out and see it. I'm going to remove the mirror. When it hits me, it won't be able to bounce back. I won't be there. So you see, your transformation from human consciousness to Christ consciousness is going to remove the human you, which has no choice but to receive the discords of this world. You cannot do anything about it humanly. You will automatically be hypnotized by old ladies, tidal waves, broken bones. Every form of discord in the world of good and evil must make contact with you in your human mind. And you can do nothing whatsoever to remove this illusion except one thing. Take dominion over that human mind. That's the crux of the illusion, right there. It either dominates you or you dominate it. If it dominates you, you're a man of earth. When the Son of Man is revealed on earth, in the moment of judgment, that man who is sown to the flesh, who has kept that human mind open to the world of discord, that's the man who's sown to the flesh. He's the fellow who reincarnates, as you know. The eagle soars, however, for the other fellow. At the moment of judgment, he continues in a state of spiritual being independent of a physical body. He no longer needs it, in fact. He, through his spiritual consciousness, has overcome the illusions of the world which is the same as overcoming the world. Now look at that old woman and see that there stands the Christ. Christ isn't sick. Look at that boy with the broken bones. There stands the Christ. The Christ isn't sick. And another thing, look at that old woman 80 years ago when she was an infant. Who was really there? The Christ. The Christ as an infant, the Christ as an adult, the Christ as an old woman. What has changed? Not the Christ. And the Christ is the only reality there. The change is in the human concept of the Christ. The growth of that child to old woman is a mental concept. Do you see that a second up there in eternity? slow down to our level of receptivity becomes 80 years down here. One second in eternity. Slow down to human receptivity becomes an infant becoming an old woman. Or a seed becoming a tree. It's quite a big illusion. And the illusion persists because there's a you to behold it. As the Christ consciousness rises, 
you can look at that child growing into adulthood and still see only the Christ. You look at the water instead of the turbulence raised in the universal sense and you won't see the tidal wave or run from it. And you look at the child and you'll know the Christ is there without broken bones. And now you've got half the coin. Fine, it is mortal mind, true. It is universal sense. And you realize it. And the other half of the coin is the part that is the hardest. I've got to get out of there. I'm one too many. Where I stand, God has to be, not me. And then you've broken the illusion. You've broken, you've short-circuited it. It has nobody to report to except the Christ, and the Christ won't be hypnotized. The Christ will look out and see reality. The Christ will look out and see creation. The Christ will look out and see only the Christ. Where there's a woman, tidal wave, and a boy with broken bones, you humanly will look out and see multiplicity, <laughs> distortion. And so we come to this. The biggest message in the Bible for us is to lose that personal sense. In losing it, in crucifying it, there's no one here to receive the illusions, the pictures, the distortions, the false witness of universal sense. And we have lost our material sense of God's kingdom. You've cracked it wide open. That's the other side of the coin. Instead of trying to fight all the evils in the world, just get rid of the beholder and you lick them off. Whosoever will try to save his life will lose it. But whosoever will not save his life will preserve it. Whosoever will not save his personal sense of human life will attain his true life, his spiritual life. Now you see, we're not interested then simply in overcoming diseases and tidal waves and old age and weak bank accounts. It's a lot of fun along the path to do it. But at the same time, when we reach the point where we know that these things cannot come nigh our dwelling, you're beginning to exercise your rightful dominion. You're in a state of liberation. Now the phrase, to know him aright is life eternal, takes a very important significance. We weren't fighting for peanuts. We weren't trying to just remain healthy and have a nice, good, long life. That's gone. I hope to speak to you a hundred years from now, or you to me, or five hundred. We come into the realization that he wasn't fooling when he said to know God aright is life eternal. And that's what we want. We want that life eternal. And we must know him aright to have it. Now when this is your dedicated goal, rather than just a healing, you're in the infinite way with both feet, not just with your intellect. And you'll get your healings, you know that. Infinite Way has a record of approximately 80% of healings. Some of them are very astounding, and you know about some of them. But the real healing, the greatest healing of all, is when I have overcome me. That's the healing that brings you into the kingdom of God on earth. <coughs> Joel started his tape to say, when he said to know God aright is life eternal, is it possible that we do not know God aright? That's what he said. And the same phrase can be looked at this way. It is a statement to know God aright 
is life eternal, and therefore it is stating to us that we can know God aright. We can. We certainly wouldn't be given that phrase, to know him aright is life eternal, unless it were possible. I don't see how anyone with a spiritual impulse in their being could possibly settle for less. All error has come to us through a compounding of one sim single error. If you had the good fortune five million years ago to put a dollar in the bank, if there were such things, today you'd be the wealthiest person on the earth. That dollar compounded over five million years would be enough to buy Manhattan. An error comes just the same way. One error back there compounded becomes this world. Every error ever imagined began with a one original error. The belief that I and God are separate. And then came the compounding and the pyramiding into the errors that we experience today all around us.